wonderful job as always. Uh, I'm going to take a tiny bit of a rabbit trail before we kind of hit uh, what we were talking about last week. Uh, there's an old Orthodox Jewish teaching. See, the thing is, Jew Jews recognize that there is spiritual things going on in the spirit realm, but because they don't receive Jesus as Messiah, they have to find a different way to explain it. And an Orthodox teaching in the Jews is that man is physical and he is spirit, he or she. Um, so when I say man, I understand I'm meaning all people. So man is spiritual and physical, but when they are born, they are hopelessly entwined together. Like a, uh, like say a big bunch of cotton got caught in a thicket or a thorn bush. It's that complicated to kind of pluck it out and get all the residue off. And they say a man's life as a Jew is to live in such spiritual discipline that that spirit begins to slowly detach from your physical man. So that upon your death, it'll be an easy transition into the spirit realm. Now here's where it gets weird. Because see, Jews do not believe in hell. They do not see Satan as an enemy. They see Satan as, an, as, a, as a, a friend and an ally of God that uh, he uses as a tool to bring opposition because we cannot have any appreciation of the goodness of God without opposition. Now, this is a Jewish teaching. This is not Christianity. Okay? So when a person dies, they don't, they don't go to hell. Their spirit stays inside their decomposing body. Now think about that for a minute. So they're actually watching you're actually watching yourself decompose. Why are you telling me this, Pastor Tim? Well, it's, it, I've got a point. Okay, uh, so if you lived well, and if you live with great spiritual discipline, at the moment you die, your spirit can easily detach from your body and it won't have to suffer. Right? So you spent your whole life picking that junk out of the thicket because you've lived disciplined life. You've lived in, in light of eternity. But if you did not live a disciplined life, then your spirit is all tangled up in your physical body and it can't get loose. So it can stay there for however long it takes for your spirit to eventually detach and pick up all the pieces as your body sits and decomposes. Uh, so they believe that, you, that your spirit can watch your physical man completely decompose and still be stuck in that grave until it can actually fully detach. So we clearly know the Jews got it wrong in that, right? However, one thing they did get right is that our life, we should focus on our spirit man, right? So that's an accurate revelation they have, but an inaccurate conclusion. And as Christians, we know that's not the case, right? When we die, it's over. The Bible says it's appointed for a man wants to die, and then the judgment. So with that said, the little rabbit trail I want to take is I want to talk about the spiritual man for a minute because I think we misunderstand a lot of things about it. So I'm going to take you to some verses that weren't on the cue card up there and we'll just, we'll just have to, to go with it. And it's, it's not super important that you find it. But Ephesians 2.6 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven and that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Now, how is that possible if we're physically here? So I would submit to you that our spirit man is not bound to a physical location. This is going to mess with some of your heads today, but I think it's important. Our spirit man is not bound to a physical location. If it was bound to a physical location, then things like Ezekiel 37, 1, Ezekiel 43, 5, Ezekiel 3, 12 through 14. Let's turn to a couple of those. Let's go ahead and go to Ezekiel, uh, let's go with 37, Valley of the Dry Bones. But three times it mentions that Ezekiel was carried away in the spirit by the spirit. It's, it's super interesting. And then it happens again in the New Testament. Can anybody guess where it happens in the New Testament? It happens to Paul, and then it happens in one more place. 
Huh? It happens in Revelation. And it may happen more than that, but... It happened to Jesus a few times. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel 37, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. Now, we hear the story of the dry bones, and we're not going to get into that, but that happens at least three times in the book of Ezekiel, where he's carried in the spirit. Now, I, I want to take you to the one in chapter 43, because I think this one's really interesting. Because you may say, well, you know, God may have carried his physical body to a location. But I'm going to show you that it was only his spirit man that was carried. Because I'm going to tell you something else. Your spirit man is not bound by location, and it is not bound by time. Let me, let me submit this to you. How did we, it's, it's commonly accepted that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, right? How did he write the account of creation? No man was there until day six. His spirit man must have been taken to a place in the past to see it. But let me show you how someone's spirit man was taken to the future. Now, I'm not talking about time travel and back to the future and DeLoreans and weird stuff, okay? Although this does sound kind of weird when you think about it. Let's just go ahead and start with verse 1. It says, he led me to the gate, and the gate was facing east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was coming from the east, and the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters. The earth shone with his glory, and the vision I saw was just like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and just like the vision I had seen by the Shabar Canal. So we're clearly talking about not a physical experience, right? And he says, as the glory of the Lord entered the temple of the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now, you want to know why I know that this is in Ezekiel's future? Because this temple doesn't exist yet. The one that is described is the final temple. N not the one that's built by human hands. So Ezekiel's spirit man was taken. How do you think prophets can see the future? It's because their spirit man is capable. You could say time travel. It, it, it sounds a lot weirder that way. But God lets you see things to come. So your spirit man is not bound by location. You're, it's not bound by the time-space laws. Now just think about that for a second. This is a little bunny trail that I decided to go on right before we get really started. Because... He says our citizenship is in heaven. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Does anybody know what that says? It says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So see, our spirit man is eternal. So it is not bound by space and time. That means you can go anywhere, see anything at any time in history. If the, now, I have to admit, this isn't super common. Okay, this is something that happens every day. However, if we don't recognize its possibility, it'll never happen. Amen? And see, we get ourselves to a place to where we limit ourselves to our physical being. We're just like that Jew that has the, told you I was going to tie it in, that has the, the cotton all tangled up in the thicket, and we can't see in the spirit realm because we're so bound by the physical body. Do you know that our, our spirit man has eyes? Why else would Paul say, open the eyes of our hearts? Our, spirit, our spiritual man has a language. Amen? It says to pray in the spirit. Right? So when we get to a place to where we can recognize the limitless nature of our spirit man, doesn't this almost sound weird new agey? But when you tie it to the word of God, it loses its weirdness. And Where do you think the new age got these concepts from? They stole them from the word of God, perverted them, and made them man-centric. But when we look at the scripture and we recognize that we have a spirit man, we have to accept the fact that the limitations of our spirit man have to come off. I don't know how many times the Bible says, and I was carried away in the spirit. But I do want to take you and give you a New Testament example of this in Revelation 21.10. And I'm sure there are more than two in the New Testament. 
But the two that I was able to find while worship was going on and I was receiving this revelation um, were the two obvious ones. But Revelation 21, and this is the new heaven and the new earth, another thing that, hasn't, that doesn't exist yet, right? Revelation 21, 9, it says, And then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues and spoke to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, I believe this is the same temple that Ezekiel saw. Amen. Amen. So John was able to, Mike, thank you. I'll I'll help you out, brother. I'll let you get it out of your system every great now and then. (laughs) So when we really look at it like that, don't you want to feed that thing? Don't you want to feed the thing that is not susceptible to time-space laws? That can actually see things that haven't happened yet and see things that have already happened. Again, how did Moses get the revelation of the creation? And it wasn't like, well, God created stuff and then here we are. I mean, there's some detail in there. Right? I mean, it, 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 the, the first two chapters of Genesis are, are very detailed. Adam and Eve never met Moses and told them the story. That was many years later. It's pretty fascinating when we really think about how neglected our spirit man is. But how powerful it is. If we were to unleash it and recognize it and utilize it and feed it. It's unbelievable how malnourished we are spiritually. And then we're killing ourselves physically eating rot. And you know some ways you can kill your spirit man? There are things on television that you feed your spirit man. You're fascinated with the supernatural and the zombies and all these other things. That stuff is being absorbed by your spirit and it's tying you to this planet. It's tying you to this realm. It's tying you to time and space. It's keeping you attached to that physical body just like that cotton stuck in the thicket. It can't get loose. See, the thing the Jews got wrong is the spirit and the body are never supposed to be fully bound together. The spirit is supposed to be able to to detach now. Again, he told Ezekiel, I was carried away in the spirit. John, I was carried away in the spirit. Three times Ezekiel went to a location that he was not (laughs) currently at physically. (laughs) Got vapor lock there. Um, too many words, not enough breath. And uh, one time he took him to a place that does not yet exist. He did the same thing for John. He took Peter, or I'm sorry, Paul. He took Paul into um, the third heaven. Says so he saw things that can't be repeated. As a matter of fact, I believe John in Revelation said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So it was a Sunday, and he was in the Spirit. See, we need to be people that are in the Spirit. Because that is where the limitations come off. The reason we don't see the miraculous today is because we are not people that recognize that we can live in the Spirit. See, when your Spirit is in control, then the limitations of your physical man are reduced to virtually nothing. Now, obviously, we can't physically time travel yet. It'd be kind of awkward anyway. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> what if you went to the year and you were already dead? <laughs> It'd be kind of awkward to know that, wouldn't it? Oops. <laughs> so we're not talking about that, but however, our spirit, man, the, the limitations are merely on our physical body. Amen. So think about this. We're already seated in heavenly places with Christ. Now, obviously, we're not physically there. But in spirit, we are. And we have access to things in the spirit that our physical body cannot attain. You know, nights like this and teachings like this uh, is one of the reasons why a, a very core value that we have at Lakeside is reading the Bible cover to cover. Because you can get cuckoo in a flat second if you don't have a full grasp of the entire word of God. Which book of the Bible do I preach out of every Sunday and every time I teach? All of them. All of them. 
You know why? Because all of them shape my view of whatever text that I'm preaching and teaching. And unless we have that buried inside of us to where we are reading the Bible cover to cover on a regular basis, and at the first of the year, I'm going to challenge everyone to do a 90-day challenge. It can be done. It is challenging, but it can be done. For we all read the Bible together in 90 days. And uh, I, I tell you what, when you read it in, in that rapid of a form, it's amazing the things that unfold, the things you see that you didn't even realize were there. You would think it would be the opposite. You would think the faster you read it, the less revelation you would get because you won't get to ponder on it. But it's amazing how it works. You see the history of God unfold. You see details, and it's just like, it's, it's, it's something about reading it in those big chunks that just help you to just capture so much more of it. It's, an, it's, it's the reason that Acts 2 is such a core chapter for us at Lakeside. It's because those were people that knew how to function in the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was in Acts chapter 2 that the Spirit of God was poured out and they walked in that fresh and anew for the first time in human history. Man had full contact with the Spirit realm. It's why Ephesians... Four is such a core foundational text for us at Lakeside. Because it says that it's the church through the fivefold ministry that can help us reach spiritual maturity. See, it's important that we are not just physically mature. There are many people that are 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, but they're like babies in their spirit, man. They couldn't fight their way out of a baby devil, much less the king of darkness himself. This is why Ephesians 6 is such a core foundational text for us at Lakeside. Because we recognize there is a real devil and there is a real war. And that war is really in the spirit realm. And it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers and, and evil forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. It is why we are so focused on corporate prayer. Building up your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. It's not, just, it's not only important that you pray and mouth words. You pray in your spirit. That's what builds your faith. See, everything we do, we do because we feel it is critically, vitally important to the one thing that we need to be building on a constant basis, and that is our spirit man. Christians today are so spiritually anemic and so biblically illiterate, sometimes it almost seems hopeless. But I serve a God that is able to speed up time. I serve a God that is able to help us retain and learn things quickly because I believe time is running short. And I believe that if we can find people that will engage and put their spirit man in drive and say, I'm going to feed it, I'm going to nurture it, I'm going to fill it with the word, I'm going to be devoted to the things of God, I'm going to be a person that walks in the spirit. Uh, with that said, let's go to Galatians chapter 5. I can already tell I'm going to run out of time. Those bunny trails are costly. Galatians is right before Ephesians, right after Corinthians. Chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 16. This is, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So Paul is making a dichotomy, a separation between spirit man and physical man. He says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. So one thing you've got to recognize, if, you're a spirit, if you have a spirit man and a physical man, is that your physical man is in opposition to your spirit man. Amen? That's why it has to be disciplined. That's why it has to be trained. And that's why it has to be basically made weak. So the spirit man can be made strong. I believe it's impossible to have a strong physical man. Now, not, I'm not talking about like working out. But I'm talking about something that is constantly catered to. Giving in to every single desire that your physical man wants. Uh, let me say this. I'd say it's impossible to have a pleased spirit man and a pleased uh, 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 flesh man as well. Because they're in opposition to each other. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. And these two are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. See, if you go back to Romans chapter 7, see, the Bible is like a big blanket. It's all tied together. 
In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, the things I do, I don't do those things. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I do. Why? Because, see, he recognizes that his spirit man is in opposition to his flesh man. So when his flesh man is in control, he can't do the things he wants to do. How many of you don't have to raise your hands, but you have found yourself caught up in something. And you're like, how did I get caught in this trap again? Why do I keep going back to this same habit, this same sin, the same thing that keeps beating me down? I know I'm not supposed to do this because your flesh is stronger than your spirit man. Listen to this. He says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Woo! Now, people like that part. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Well, remember, I told you all, I think it was Sunday, grace teaches us to say no. Some people use this as an excuse to say yes. Titus 2.11, write it down. I guarantee you I'm telling the truth. He says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, why are you not under the law if you're led by the Spirit? Striper had an album called Above the Law. Now, they used it, right, to be in opposition to the law. However, as Christians, we are above the law, meaning we are, it's, it's, it's like I'm above being taught how to walk. My son is potty training right now. If I'm 46 and I'm still being potty trained, there's a problem. I'm above potty training, right? I'm smarter than that. So when we're led by the Spirit, we're smart enough that the law doesn't have to lead us anymore because we're being led by the Spirit man. Make sense? We don't have to get caught in those traps anymore because the Spirit man's in control. We don't need the law to say don't lie because it's not in our nature to lie anymore. Right? So we are not under the law. We're over it. We're above it. Now, (laughs) the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. Now, here's an interesting thing. See, most people know that the New Testament is written in Greek. Now, we know that Jesus also spoke Aramaic and also spoke Hebrew, and he also possibly spoke Latin. But the New Testament was recorded in Greek. And the word for sexual immorality there, anybody want to give it a guess? If you already know, don't, don't spoil it. Okay, if you do know it, spoil it. What is it? Hornea. Interesting, isn't it? It's the root word for the English word pornography. So sexual immorality does not just mean physical activity. It's spiritual perversion as well. Why do you think Jesus said when you look at a woman to lust for her, you've already committed adultery where? In your heart, in your spirit man. Right? So your spirit man is capable of committing adultery. Interesting, isn't it? So we think, oh, I didn't go the whole way, but your spirit man did. All right. Impurity, which just means to mix, to be mixed with a little bit of good, a little bit of evil. No, I'm going to serve Jesus today, but I'm going to throw a little bit of this in there. That's being impure. Sensuality, that's basically uh, dependent and tied to the senses. If it tastes good, feels good, then it must be right. Um, idolatry, that's pretty clear. That means to put anything above God. Sorcery, that Greek word is, guess what? Pharmakia. What's that sound like? Pharmacy. See, when you do drugs to get high, what's getting high? Your spirit man. And what is it susceptible to? Demonic forces. And do you know that a lot of illicit witchcraft and demonic activity involves drugs check me on that see if I'm right enmity that's just basically just disagreement and fighting strife that's like a level above that to where you hate a person jealousy that's pretty obvious it's when somebody else has something and you're not happy about it or you want it fits of anger that's when you don't have any control over your emotions you're just always up and down and all over the place A lot of people will medicate it. Sometimes I think it is a discipline problem. Because if you discipline your flesh, your spirit won't manifest these things. And he goes on, he says, drunkenness, which is obvious. Orgies, uh, I don't think we need to explain that one. And and things like these. So in other words, he's saying this isn't an exhaustive list. It's just things that are kind of in this spirit, in this vein. Things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, 
those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now, oh man, this is, this is, mm. See, here's the thing. God is spirit. You agree? That's what John said. So God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? So if God is spirit, that means he's, his spirit has attributes. Because God has attributes. What's one of the most well-known attributes of God? The Bible says God is love. That is an attribute. Okay? An attribute is a character trait or a quality that someone or something possesses. Now, there are some qualities or attributes that are non-communicable. Okay, that means they belong to God alone. They cannot be shared, okay? We are not eternal. We have not always been. That is an attribute that cannot be shared. Now, there are several non-communicable attributes um, that, that God cannot share with us because we're not him. We're not going to get into that today. But there are many communicable attributes, Okay, and what that means is they are things that are like him that he will share with people. All right, and that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's the attributes, the spiritual attributes of God that he shares with man because we were made in his image. Genesis 126. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And he lists them. He says uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So see, we can't love like God loves because we're not perfect like him yet, but we can love. See, and that's an attribute of the, this isn't a trick question, folks, the spirit, right? So love comes from our spirit man. And then it says joy. Now, what's the Bible say about the joy? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Whose joy? The Lord. Is it my joy? I thank God I'm not dependent on my joy. But I have access to his joy through the Spirit. I love this. And it goes on and it says, peace. Whew, I know some folks that could use some peace. Lives are nothing but a swirling ball of chaos. And they throw it all over Facebook so everybody else can know their life is a swirling ball of chaos. And then they post the next day for everybody to get out of their business. That always cracks me. I wish everybody would get out of my business. And I feel like saying, if you wouldn't post it every day, nobody would know your business. Man, when adults took over Facebook, things just got weird, didn't it? Jeez. <laughs> I wish I was making this up. But peace is an attribute of God. It's an attribute of the Spirit. And it's a place where there's no conflict. There's no lack of clarity. There's no lack of focus. There's no distractions. There's nothing in the way. It's just an atmosphere to where everything is crystal clear. We can have that. Not to the degree that God has it. Or maybe we can. I've never been there. Patience. Ooh. I've always heard, don't pray for patience. I don't care. I pray for patience. I say, don't pray for patience because God will send you tribulation. What Bible are they reading? Kindness, which is basically the same thing as brotherly kindness, Philadelphia, brotherly love. In other words, just being nice to people, you realize that's transformative, right? Kindness has transformative power. Matter of fact, all the attributes of the Spirit have tra has transformative power. And then it says, goodness. And goodness is just a quality of being good, like God. God is good. That's an attribute that He is. Faithfulness. You know, we're sticking to something. Gentleness. That's basically when you want to slap somebody upside the head, but you don't because you're being gentle. Self-control. Boy, that's a whoo. Self-control. Don't give in to everything your flesh wants. Control yourself. This is against such there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now listen to this. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I've never been in the military, don't claim to uh, understand the military, but I do know that there is a thing in the military called cadence. And in cadence, they march in step with one another. And when you have a perfectly trained outfit, it sounds pretty intimidating. All in step. And that's how we're to be with the Spirit. 
in step, cadence with the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. Because see, then the law has no power over us. There is only one reason the law is necessary. Does anybody know what that reason is? Sin. Sin is the only reason the law was ever needed. But if we're, can we walk in the Spirit and sin? See, when we sin, that means we step out of cadence with the Spirit and walk in cadence with the flesh. Now, there is forgiveness for that, but there is also setbacks in that. David never had peace in his house again because of sin. Sin can have devastating consequences if you keep wallowing in it and keep messing in it. It knocks you out of step with the Spirit. Now, we talked about spiritual gifts and gifts of the Spirit, and the spiritual gifts are charisma. Those are things that are naturally possessed, that God gives you at birth, that you're naturally good at. And then there's the pneumaticos, which is the gifts of the Spirit. And when we walk in the Spirit, not only is there fruit and attributes, but there are gifts that begin to function and flow in our lives. Why do we not see the gifts of the Spirit manifest and flow often in God's churches today? It's because we are fleshly and we are carnal and we are sold to the things of this world. And if we get to a place where we get beyond those things, the New Testament church was so detached from this world that people were selling properties, lands, and homes and laying them at the feet of the apostles. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do that. But I am suggesting, as a matter of fact, I actually would submit to you that that wasn't the homes they were living in. Because th that doesn't even make sense. Where, where would they go at that point? And some people have used that to do this weird communal living thing that always ends with weird stuff, okay? Um, I don't believe that communal living is what the New Testament community is about. I think it's about living in, there's a, there's a very fine line between communal living and community living. Um, communal always leads to perversion and weirdness. Community leads to power. And I believe that's what the New Testament church lived in, community. They sold their extra homes, they sold the things they did not need, the things that they were not using, and they cashed them out and gave them to the church for the purpose of building the church because they were all unified together. They all had one mind. You believe that's possible? The Bible says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, for we have the mind of Christ. How many minds does Christ have? Is he schizophrenic, confused? He has one. What does it say in Acts chapter 2? The believers were all of one mind. And whose mind was it? The mind of Christ. See, they were perfectly in tune in cadence with the Spirit. Together. See, it's, it's, it's one thing when an individual figures out what it's like to walk in cadence with the Spirit. It's a whole different level when a body of believers figure it out. Can you imagine an entire uh, congregation being carried away in the Spirit? Can you imagine an entire congregation being on absolutely the same page, seeing the same thing, saying the same thing, walking? What would it look like? Read Acts chapter 2. That's what it would look like. Lame man standing outside by the gate, getting healed. Amen? Peter walking into a dead girl's house, putting all the doubters out, and raising her from the dead. See, if we want to get to that place, we have got to, the Bible says, crucifying the flesh and its desires. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but, the, but Christ in me. This is, I, I, could, I guess I could say this is weighty stuff, but it's only weighty because we don't lift the heavy weights. You go to the gym and you stick with the 12 pound dumbbells, 100 pounds is going to seem pretty rough. But you build your way up and you go to the 15, then the 20, then the 25, and then you're lifting 100 pounds every day and it's nothing. Weights only seem heavy because you don't practice to get to that point. You don't build yourself up to that point. It's my time looking like 15 minutes. Anybody got any questions? Any insights? Any thoughts? Okay. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, you will hear the realm you walk in. That is for sure. And the thing is, 
the Bible says that uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and our, 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 our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it says it's against arguments. It says we have the power to demolish strongholds. And the thing is, it says casting down arguments. Now, that's really interesting. Because when we argue, who do we typically argue with? People, right? Let's, I mean, if, if you want to divide this room right now and cause a fight, that's all I have to do is say, well, all the Trump supporters raise their hands. <laughs> and you will have pandemonium in this place. Because there will be some people that agree. Some, why? Because we see people as the enemy. And see, the problem with people that are tied up in politics is they see people as the solution as well. Yep, it's working. All right. But we have to look higher for the solution. See, when we argue with people, that is flesh arguing with flesh. But when we take our battle to the heavenlies and we put on the armor of God, and then we start speaking out truth. And then we start speaking words of faith. And then we start declaring our salvation. And then we pick up the word and say, this is my sword. When we put on our shoes and say, the gospel of peace is how I walk. Then all of a sudden, we are treading where angels tread. And we are fighting demonic forces that can tear down those arguments. See... What if we spent more time tearing arguments down than having them? Wonder what kind of world we'd have. Because I'll be honest, I don't care who voted for who, what, I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, I don't care. Your political affiliation is not important to me, it's your spiritual affiliation that matters. Who are you aligned to? Now there will be people that can argue both sides of the gamut as to which party is evil. Okay, why? Because it's man. People are messed up. The sooner we realize that, the, the less importance that'll play in our life. People are just, you depend on people, and that's a, what a miserable dependency to have. Right? 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 Here, just so people can hear you. Last week, you said something about the... Uh, last week. <laughs> last week. Okay, this week, the time travel helps me to understand how Moses got all that info and how John got the picture of heaven and all that. Um, that had any, yeah. Last week, you said something about um, the dominion and how 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 man flesh had the dominion i can't remember how you worded it but man had dominion and failed fell and then satan through man had dominion right. and jesus had to come in flesh right. to, he, he had to come as a human in right. flesh to yeah. regain right and that blew my mind too to help me to understand oh you know that's that's how, that's how Satan still has dominion. So when something like what happens to my cousin, what happened to my cousin was murdered, you know, and people were like, oh, it's, you know, how would God let stuff like that happen? You know, it, it's, Satan still has dominion through non-Christians. Right, yes. And, that's why it's called God's world. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, Satan can operate through human dominion. And uh, that, that's a core concept. Because that was man's role. Tim, did you, you, you kind of, flip, you well, did the hand flutter. It was the whole oh, was it? Thing. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the reason why, you know, we see in the scripture where God takes people in spirit, because the physical body cannot survive. If Moses went to the beginning of carnal time, before pre-carnal time, there was no oxygen. There was nothing to breathe. There was nothing for physicality to live as we know it. No, day one, no, absolutely. There's no place to be. You know, vacuum of space, basically. So, I mean, the spirit man gives God the ability to take man above and beyond. Right. So if he took the whole body in, time, in future, it would age rapidly. Suddenly, you'd be a thousand years old. 
Yeah. And then, or if he took you back in time, you wouldn't exist. You'd just go back to being an egg and beyond that. And then your, your great, 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 great grandfather's egg or sperm. You know, you'd be, you know, you'd just be really messed up. <laughs> he doesn't say sperm and church. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Yeah, so in other words, your physical body is not capable of doing that because of the impact it would have. Yes. Uh, and your spirit, man, whoo, I'll tell you what, that was the scientist just jumped out of him out of nowhere, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. So here is the powerful thing, and I taught about this Sunday, so I'm not going to revisit it because I don't have time. But the fruit of the Spirit are virtually relisted in 2 Peter chapter 3, or chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And it says in, in that that we are partakers of the divine nature, right? His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And we are partakers through these precious promises of his divine nature. And then it says that we can add to our faith virtue or goodness. And it lists the fruit of the Spirit, and it talks about the fact that they can grow. So here's where I'm going to tell you not to be discouraged. Okay, because it can be pretty discouraging when you hear this is where we're supposed to be, but we're not there yet. The fact is, there's this, this thing that, that fancy people call sanctification. It means you start at one point, and then you grow, and then you go to a new level. Okay, the Bible says, from glory to glory. I think it's 2 Corinthians 4, 8, but I might be wrong. It says we're going from, or the, the, or the other translations say, ever-increasing glory. Because Moses hid his face because the glory was fading. We don't have that issue anymore. Now the glory can grow in us. And that means that the attributes can grow in us. You realize we can love more tomorrow than we do today. We can have more joy tomorrow than we do today. And we can grow and we can increase in those things. And here's the really cool promise. If we will commit to growing our spirit, man, Peter gave a promise that we would never fall. He also said we wouldn't be unfruitful and ineffective. So we can be effective. We can be fruitful. And we can be once saved, always saved. Provided... It doesn't sound like once they've always saved, there's a provided, does it? Provided that these things are growing in us. Right? Now, again, I don't believe that in eternal security, you can live however you want and blah, blah, blah. But I also don't believe in eternal insecurity. That every time you mess up, you got to get saved all over again, baptized all over again, do all that stuff all over again. Gosh, hitting the reset button constantly would just be whew, tiring, wouldn't it? You slip, you get up right where you are. You don't go all the way back to the beginning. You, it's not like Monopoly. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just pick up where you are. If you're on barbed walk, just keep on going. And then you will grow. And your spirit man, as your spirit man grows, your, your flesh can't take control. And you will be successful in your spiritual journey. So I hope that this little two-week kind of in-between thing has been helpful. Um, the next two weeks, we're going to be doing some Jewish festivals. Next week is Feast of Trumpets. And then after that is Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Feast of Trumpets is New Year, right? Also called Rosh Hashanah? Yes. So we will be celebrating the Jewish New Year. Um, during the Jewish New Year, it is always a time of reflecting of the previous year. It's kind of like we do in America in the New Year, and making resolutions and, and various things, that, and Jews would make promises to God. And, and while uh, resolutions tend to fade over time, maybe this would be a good time for you to reflect and say, God, how, what can I do to feed my spirit man? And maybe some of you want to get the jump on us and say, well, there's still 90 days plus left in this year. You know, maybe you jump in, download you version of the, of the app, and there's a ton of plans, and there's a 40-day New Testament read that I'm currently doing. Um, there is a 90-day Bible read, which I've done four times now, and it is, it, it is shaping. So if you want your spirit man to grow, you have to feed it spiritual food. Yes? Yeah, you version, Bible Gateway, there's all kinds of audio. Um, here's my problem with audio. Maybe you're not wired like me, but uh, I tend to float. <laughs> and, then this, and then three chapters happen, and I'm like, whoop, wait a minute. So when I listen, I also still read. Well, I have that problem sometimes, but that's my option. Yeah. <laughs> that's the way I roll right there. Were you going to, I saw the hand flutter. Did, were you just agreeing or? Agreeing. Okay. I cannot. Yeah. So. Even when I'm listening to the audio, I'm still reading. Sometimes the audio will help me because I'm tired and I don't feel like reading, so it's a way for me to keep myself disciplined. Uh, do whatever it takes. Get in the Word. Get in prayer. Join us corporately. 
Um, that's why we have these core foundational ideas and texts that we do is because we believe that that's the way to win. Amen? Amen. So any more questions? No, but I got a, like a praise. All right, what's the praise? Ben, didn't have Amen. Yeah, their, uh, their daughter broke her leg and did, did, I saw it, it was bad. Um, and they were concerned she was going to actually have to have surgery, but they were able to set the bone and uh, put a cast on it. And I thank God for that. But I'm looking for the day when I can grab a hold of that leg. Jesus put an ear back on a dude. Yes. Amen. 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 So I'm to the place where, I, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish doctors. Matter of fact, Dr. Norman is my favorite doctor. I'm not trying to diminish what they do, but I'm telling you, we can get beyond what they do. Amen. All right. Well, Father, we thank you for revelation knowledge. Lord, we thank you that we can, we can feed our spirit man spiritual nutrients, Lord, that we won't have to feed it garbage of, of media and junk that we take into our spirit man on a regular basis. Lord, help us to always keep in mind when we're watching that movie, when we're listening to that song, when we're reading that book, when we're participating in that activity, that we are feeding our spirit man something. Is it good? Is it righteous? Is it edifying? Is it at least not of Satan? And Lord, help us to never feed ourselves things that belong to the enemy. Help us to always be cognizant and aware. Lord, help our spirit to groan when we do something that hurts it. Help us to sense the senses of the spirit. Our spirit can be grieved. So Lord, I pray that it would be grieved when we partake of things that are not of you and that offend your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you all. See you on Friday. 7 o'clock, then Sunday. God bless you.